horrible averages. Even. Um, higher even than the averages for the general population. 38% sexually abused at some time in their, in their childhood or adult life. Uh, so even as adults, threats of violence, insulted or abused, these aren't just microaggressions, these are insults, abuse, harassment. So I've titled this slide, sorry it gets better, but it doesn't. Um, you know, being an adult, being out, being proud doesn't stop people from abusing you. Let's talk about Michigan in particular. It's estimated 4% of the adults in Michigan identify as LGBTQ, which is about 311,400 last time I checked. Um, and that's really sad when you think about the fact that there are some legal barriers that are in the way. Um, this first one, no enumeration of the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. There's a Civil Rights Act within Michigan that says you can't discriminate against people based on their gender and their race and things, but they don't say sexual or gender identity or expression. So it is legal in Michigan to discriminate against LGBT people. Now, certain municipalities have laws that say you can't, but the state does not enumerate, does not specifically state, you can't discriminate on, on these bases. There are also legal barriers that are just not pro-family for LGBT people. No second parent adoption, um, no, I mean, discrimination based on foster care placement. It's, it's legal if you are a religious organization to say, oh yeah, we don't, we don't let LGBTQ people foster children because you know, it's not safe. Um, it's illegal in the state of Michigan to hire a surrogate to carry a child. I have several gay male friends who have gone, have had to bear the expense of uh, finding someone out of state to have their child and then going through the adoption process and bringing the child back here. One of them at a party this weekend told me that when he took his son to get his passport, the documentation said, and both, and both parents must be present. Well, the biological mom is in Texas. She can't come to this, fill out this form for the passport. It's just ridiculous. Uh, this is stressful. These are barriers. Nationally, um, currently, LGBT adults are struggling. Um, they're still having, not everyone, but a lot will report that they have had suicidal ideation, that they have made a suicide attempt, or that they engage in non-suicidal self-injury, such as cutting. Uh, this is a result of the stress. This is not that inherently LGBT people are mentally ill. Uh, it's just, it's a burden. Specifically in Michigan, LGBT adults are more often diagnosed with major depressive disorder. They smoke more, they binge drink more. Those have health impacts for sure. Let's look at the data on youth. This is again from two studies. Uh, these have a lot more subjects in them. GLSEN is the Gay, Le Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network. And they do a national school climate survey, survey every couple of years and then publish the results. And then CDC does, uh, Centers for Disease Control does a youth behavior risk surveillance system study. They don't do all of the country, but they do 10 states and nine large urban school district high school students. And one of the states is Michigan and Detroit is one of the school districts they use. And it's you know 120 students roughly. So it's, it's pretty good data in terms of its accuracy. So here's what kids are saying based on the GLSEN study. Pretty much close to 100% here, gay, used in a negative way. That's so gay. Don't be gay. No homo. Um, that's hurtful. Those are microaggressions. 95% here, other homophobic remarks. 91.8% uh, reply that they heard negative remarks about gender expression. 
you know, don't be a sissy. Don't, you know, you throw like a girl. Um, don't, you know, I, I'm sure there are negative comments made about being too masculine as well. Here's what's even more abhorrent. Homophobic remarks from school staff. Negative remarks about gender from staff. The result, a lot of our LGBTQ students feel unsafe at school. So often they don't attend <laughs> or they can't focus. Those were verbal and emotional. This is the physical assault. Again, the numbers are just horrible. Physical harassment, threats, things like that. Physical assault, being shoved, being uh, you know kicked, spit on. Ten uh, percent. Hard to imagine. And again, the worst, in my opinion, over 60% who did report an incident said the staff, nothing happened. There was no consequence. The result, poor academic outcomes. What a surprise. Students who have experienced high levels of victimization have lower GPAs, miss schools three times as much as often, are only half as likely to pursue post-secondary education, have higher levels of depression and lower levels of self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting, there was a study done by, uh, I'll get to later a study about how to kind of combat that, as would be suspect, you know, expected based on uh, the fact that minority stress is uh, additive and synergistic, LGBT youth of color experience higher frequencies of victimization than other groups. What about when kids come out at home? 50% get a negative reaction. When families are highly rejecting, they have poorer mental health outcomes. They're eight times more likely to have attempted suicide than kids who have supporting or accepting families. They're six times more likely to be depressed and they're three and a half times more likely to use drugs and engage in unprotected sex and other dangerous behaviors. Again, minority youth have it worse, no surprise. Two times higher among black and Hispanic youth than white youth. 25% of teens are forced to leave home after coming out. The flip side of that is that over 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. And gay homeless youth abuse alcohol more than their straight homeless peers. So it's just additive. It just, it gets, it gets, you know, instead of it gets better, it gets worse and worse. You go to school, you're harassed, and then the school does nothing about it. More than half of transgender non-binary youth said they had seriously considered attempting suicide in the last year. Higher among black, transgender, non-binary youth. Like I said, this is, this is good data. I mean, there's a lot of data here in these, these uh, the GLSEN and the CDC study. They asked about a lot of things and really peeled things apart. So how do you prevent suicide among trans youth and, and adults? Um, use their chosen name. It's a name you saw on, my, on the first slide, Antonia Coretto, you see on my Zoom, Tony. You would have no problem using my chosen name. Use their chosen name. If you're able to use your chosen name in one context, it reduces your suicidal thoughts by almost in third. Having your pronouns used by everyone in the house, 50% reduction in suicide attempts. And if you're able to use your chosen name in four contexts, so that would include like online school, you know, peers, work, home, community, huge impact, a lot less depression, decrease suicidal thoughts, decrease in suicide attempts. There's a simple solution here. Also GSAs, Gay Straight Alliances at schools. Katzen Bueller found that schools that have GSAs have reduced suicidality for 
all the youth in the school, not just the LGBTQ youth. Everyone in the school feels safer. Everyone in the school feels more respected. As it relates to youth, there, is, there are pieces of legislation and stigmas and, and barriers uh, that are problematic that we really need to address. Um, for instance, conversion therapy is still legal in Michigan. So if a kid comes out to their parent, their parent has the right to take them to a therapist or a church and attempt to cure them through reparative therapy, which is abuse, but it's legal. Again, certain municipalities have outlawed it, but the state does not have any statute or law that says you can't do this. APA has said this is abuse, this is not therapy. It is legal in Michigan. Again, the anti-bullying law as it applies to youth in schools is not enumerated. It says you can't bully someone based on their body size or their you know, uh, gender or their race or their religion, but it doesn't say you can't bully them if they're gay or trans, or if you think they're gay or trans. It's not enumerated. There are about 61,000 LGBT youth in Michigan. So this is not just a minority of, I mean, it is a minority, but it's, it's a pretty significant number of kids. 9.2% of those in grades nine through 12 identify as LGB based on the GLSEN study. So you've got a, a relatively big high school, like we do in the Metro Detroit area, 2,000 students, do the math, 9.2%. What is that? I mean, that's, that's huge, a couple hundred students. Nationally, almost 2% of youth identify as transgender. So statistically, there's someone in your kid's school who identifies as LGBT. If we look at Michigan students in particular, compared to their non-LGBT peers, they're bullied more, they miss school more, they have more incidents of thoughts of suicide, they smoke, they drink, they use marijuana, they probably have unsafe sex, probably shoplift, probably, yeah. It, it's just horrible outcomes and there are, there are things we can do about this and should be doing about it. So what to do in the classroom? Be a safe space and a supportive adult. You can get stickers from various organizations that say safe space or you know, put a rainbow flag up um, that will signal to a, a, a youth, this is a safe space, you can talk to me. Use the preferred name and pronouns. I know it's hard, but you can do it. Use inclusive phrases to address students. So, you know, no more boys and girls. <laughs> because not everyone identifies as one of those. Um, but, you know, scholars, you know, friends, uh, you know, peeps, whatever you need to say, but make it generic. Don't make it gender-based. Group students in ways that don't rely on the gender binary. I mean, I still hear about, you know, like the boys, you know, book club and, and the, it blows my mind. Like what? We're still dividing kids based on gender or what we think their gender is? That's just ridiculous. There's no need for that. Immediately intervene if there's any bullying. And include some gender variant resources in the classroom, whether it's books or magazines or posters, you know, acknowledge that there is diversity. There's an organization called Welcoming Schools, which is uh, part of the HRC, the Human Rights Campaign that has lesson plans by grade level to, to, to challenge gender role norms, um, age appropriate, all laid out for you. This is what, this is your assignment for summer vacation. In therapy, the biggest issue with trans people is, is, you know, it's not your job to help them figure out their gender. Your biggest job with the, the, with the patient and with their family is to help them manage uncertainty and anxiety. What does this mean? What's gonna happen? I, just be a holding place for that. Um, you can help them clarify and explore their sexuality and their gender. If someone comes to me and they say, I'm trans, I say, that's great. What does that mean to you? I wanna know what that means to you. And I ask that of everyone with whatever they present with. If they say, I'm a New York Yankees fan, I say, that's great. What does that mean to you? 
I want to, I want to help them be able to articulate and clarify for themselves what that means. I'm not challenging, I'm not doubting, but this is what therapy is all about, right? Alleviate the distress related to identity and comorbidity. That can be referring someone to a support group or giving them materials to read or websites to look at. And the comorbidity, I mean, if, if you see a kid that's you know unsafe, you need to make sure they're safe. Uh, if they're suicidal, if they're anxious, you've got to treat these comorbid disorders. If they're failing school, it's, you know, it's your job to intervene. A lot of these, a lot of people who are on the P, who are uh, LGBT have have because of this minority stress, they meet criteria probably for PTSD. So you've got to help them with those psychosocial difficulties that are a result of that. Educate, advocate in your spare time and within session. Uh, help facilitate a coming out process and understand that it is a process uh, for trans youth and adults support difficult decisions, you know, what to do about transition, what to do about coming out, what to do about hormones, and help the person develop a positive self-concept. You know, these are, these are people who are really working hard on understanding themselves. That's great. They need to be given some, some uh, you know, reps for that. That's, that's, that's great. Um, and at an administrative level, again, name and pronouns. Use appropriate language on all forms. I know that's hard to change if you're using a electronic medical record, but a lot of them are moving toward, I know the Henry Ford system has done a good job of having preferred name or having, uh, you know, more than just, you know, sex, MF, choose one, letting people specify how they identify both in terms of their gender and their sexuality. Provide a gender neutral bathroom if you can. Promote ongoing staff awareness and education, include images, materials, and be mindful of diversity and the importance of diversity in hiring. Not just LGBT diversity, but all sorts of diversity. And you must have a zero tolerance policy on harassment. Even if the state of Michigan doesn't have it, you must have it. So uh, I love this little cartoon. <clears throat> This is not how it happens. This is not how people decide that they're trans, of course. Um, so how to create a welcoming environment. Let the person lead. Don't make an assumption on someone's gender based on their appearance. They may be attempting to pass as something that they don't identify with. So um, someone walks up to you, don't say, can I help you, ma'am? because they may not identify as a ma'am. I personally hate that term ma'am because it makes me sound old. <laughs> um, it's their gender identification, not their gender role or the gender expression that matters. And don't ask, are you male or female? Try a different way of asking it. Like, where are you on the gender spectrum? How do you identify? Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, changing your language, changing your assumptions, it's a hard thing to do, but if you start doing it, it, it becomes easier. Again, I can never stress this enough. Use the name and pronouns that the person prefers. If you're not sure, you can ask, but there are better ways to ask. Uh, so don't ask, would you prefer he or she? Because maybe it's neither. <laughs> um, but what pronouns do you use? Uh, I have some mixed feelings about this, actually. And, and uh, you know, let me just say a little bit about that. Um, in group settings, asking everyone's pronouns really puts people, people who are in that coming out process and are maybe not out to others, maybe not out to themselves in conflict, asking them to tell us your pronouns, it puts them on the, stop, on the spot. And it still favors cisgender heteronormative people. Who have it easy? They just say their pronouns and they're they're good. It's still it's it's not an ideal. I don't know what the answer. I do know what the answer is, but I, you know it's not ideal. I mean it's better than what we had, um, but I hope it eventually goes away. In all honesty, um, I personally would prefer if we just used they for everyone and didn't gender everything and everyone. 
books, cars, clothes, soft drinks, you know, colognes. It's just crazy. So assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. Don't make an assumption about someone's affectional orientation based on their biological sex or their gender identity. So if someone was assigned female at birth, but now they are identifying as not female, maybe they're non-binary, maybe they're masculine, don't assume that they're attracted to females. And don't assume that they're not attracted to females. And if they are attracted to females, don't refer to them as gay or lesbian. The fact that they were assigned female at birth and are attracted to females, that doesn't make them a lesbian. It depends on how they identify. So if someone is assigned female and identifies as male and has a female partner, they may identify as heterosexual or straight. So I, I, that may be hard to follow, but you know, Think it through, don't make assumptions. You can't base, base it on someone's appearance. You can't base it on their biological sex and you can't base it necessarily on their gender identity. Let them define how they identify uh, and, and choose your language carefully. And hopefully you're already doing this, you know, not asking someone, you know, so what did you and your husband do this weekend? They might not have a husband. Some other tips about respectful language, um, you know, it used to be sexual preference. I, I, that kind of implies a choice. It's not, it's an orientation. It's not a choice. I mean, for people who are LGBT, many, if given the choice would not be LGBT, it's not an easy life. So use the term orientation instead. <sighs> disorder is also a problem. I know that in the DSM it's their gender identity disorder. I prefer the word variation or difference. Um, the term disorder of sexual development, you know, difference of sexual development would be better. We've moved away from using the, the term biologically female, biologically male or natal male. And we've moved away from MTF and FTM because <laughs> it's not always that, right? If someone's female and they're transgender or, or non-conforming, they might not identify as male. They might identify as non-binary or, a gender. So rather than trying to do it that way, we're, we're doing more the assigned female at birth, assigned male at birth, the implication being, and no longer identifies with that. All right, a word about they, them, there. All right, so any English majors out there, who remembers Shakespeare, thou? Romeo, Romeo, where art thou, Romeo? Thou was used as the singular version of you because you was only plural. We got over that. You can get over this idea that you have that they is plural. We now use you for you singular and you plural. We can use they for they singular, they plural. And I give these examples. We already do this. We already use they, them, and there without a problem. Oh, look, someone left their wallet behind. I wonder if the staff can contact them. They'll be so relieved to know that it's here. Not a problem. We didn't gender them because we don't know their gender. You don't know my gender. You don't know anyone's gender based on how they're presenting. That's why I vote for, we just use they for everyone, but uh, I don't know if I'm gonna see that in my lifetime. I'll give you another example. They told me about their preferred pronouns. I respect them, so I use their pronouns. A lot of people struggle with this idea about, you know, they and the, the but you we really have to get there with it. Um, don't use it. It's they, them, there for most people uh, that are non-binary or, or agender or not, you know, non, non cis and non-trans. I have my contact information. And then, um, as I said, I have a glossary of all sorts of terms that you may hear a patient refer to. Uh, you know, here's the, the assigned female at birth, assigned male at birth, um, bottom surgery, you may hear someone refer to. You need to kind of know what that means. If you think about it, it's logical. Top surgery is above the waist, bottom surgery is below the waist. 
um, we no longer say sex reassignment surgery. We tend to say gender affirming or gender confirming surgery because we're not reassigning someone's sex. We're just helping their body be more in align with what their gender is. Um, I use the term on here, gender queer. Someone, uh, you'll often hear people say identify as queer. And it could be that they're referring to their affectional orientation or their gender identity or both. Like, I just don't, I don't, I don't do the, I don't do the binary thing. Um, I don't believe that there is a binary. I don't follow it. I, you know, I, I queer the binary. I kind of turn it on its side. I, you know, like to, you know, mess with people's minds about the, their gender and my gender. Um, let me think of what else here. Uh, oh yeah, back to the MTF, FTM for male to female, female to male, a, a real common one more so now, MTE, male to eunuch. There's a certain subgroup of people who are assigned male at birth who don't feel male or female and feel neither. And when they, if and when they pursue bodily changes, they pursue bodily changes that take them there physically. Um, and you can imagine, you know, think of a Barbie doll, you know, the crotch is like, there's nothing there. That's kind of where, where people, some people are feeling most at, at home. Um, stealth refers to someone who it is, is not, it's not apparent to anyone that they are presenting as the gender that they were not assigned at birth. Um, and there are, you know, differing opinions about why people would do that and if that's good for the community, bad for the community. It's a privilege for sure if you can pass that convincingly. Um, but that's often very bias ridden. You know, we have certain expectations about a woman or a man should look like. And if you don't fit it, you may not pass as well. And that's unfortunate. Uh, and then I'll just, you know, the bottom one, World Professional Association for Transgender Health. They have a set of guidelines called the Standards of Care um, that explains in great detail how to work with transgender individuals, adults, and youth, uh, including quite a bit about the non-medical aspects, therapy, um, you know, voice therapy, um, things like that. So that's a good reference for you. And then given the rates of homelessness, I added this uh, that you should have, you know, in your desk drawer or on your phone uh, in case you encounter a youth who needs to not be at home for whatever reason. All right. So I left some time for questions. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do that if anyone has questions or comments or wants me to expand on something else. Well, Lisa, if you want to unmute, you can voice your question or you can absolutely put it in the chat. I know there's a lot of stuff we can chat about here, so feel free. Yeah. So someone put in, City of Jackson has a non-discrimination ordinance. Yes, they do. That was That's that great. Was quite the debate, but we made it through. Yes, thank you. Uh, I will say that I'm on the Jackson Pride Board, and uh, we're working a lot of different things here. So uh, I am in charge of the countywide GSA. So we just started that uh, the second Thursday of the month. Um, let's see, can I put files in here? Let's see if I can upload the flyer for that. But um, so we meet the second Thursday of the month at the downtown library at the Carnegie branch. The youth are downstairs. Uh, and uh, middle school and high school. And then upstairs, we have a parent support group. So transportation issues, took care of that. The parents and the teens are coming to the same place. Uh, and then we just go to separate rooms. So um, if you have a student that would like this, you know, purely social, uh, we, we will talk about some advocacy stuff, but purely social club for countywide. Of course, there are a lot of schools that do have a GSA. Um, and then, of course, parents that um, want some support there. We have one upstairs. Okay, so there's a question about, uh, and, and Rebecca, you might, you know, you're the Jackson person, but um, 
are there older adult transgender support groups locally? You know, one of the benefits of COVID was everything going to, you know, things going to Zoom, which yeah. makes support groups a lot more accessible. Um, so yes, there are some adult transgender support groups accessible to those who are in Jackson. Um, there's a, uh, an organization called Transgender Michigan, and they have a, a like a, a yellow pages online, and in there it includes support groups, um, doctors, lawyers, florists, <laughs> anything you can imagine. Um, and there's a group called um, Transgender Detroit that has a Zoom support group that I know that some people from Jackson attend. Um, I don't know if there are any live in-person support groups for trans adults in Jackson. Rebecca, do you know? I don't think so. Um, and then is Nate still in the room? He was starting a youth one though. Nate, do you wanna unmute? Are you still here? I'm here. Oh, don't mind cool. my background. It was from a training I did previously. <laughs> I hadn't updated it yet. Beautiful. So um, yeah, so I'm Nate Nims with the Center for Family Health. We have a uh, support group for um, LGBTQ individuals um, age 13 to 19. It's called True Colors. Um, and that is uh, led by myself. It's a peer support group. Okay. There's also an organization based in the Metro Detroit area, but has a lot of outreach again, especially because of the internet um, called Stand With Trans. And they have support groups for transgender youth wherever they identify on the spectrum. And I think they're, they're catch, you know, 13, and they actually have a, a young person's group now. I have a nine-year-old that goes to group once a month. Um, so that's one to look up as well. Stand with Trans, they have some support groups uh, and they might even have one in the Jackson, it might be Grand Rapids, yeah. but check them out. Uh, again, via Zoom, but um, if there's enough interest, they'll make it happen locally, you know, so kids can have Nate's group and another one to choose from. That would be wonderful. Um, we, resources to help. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say here at the center, we are also very open to anything that the community needs. Um, we have some providers that are, are on board with um, prescribing hormones and um, starting HRT and things like that. And I am more than happy if you have a client um, who has those needs, I'm more than happy to help coordinate that, whether that be here um, or with other resources locally. Okay, great. There's a question about resources to help parents support a transgender youth. Again, Stand With Trans, in addition to the youth groups, they have parent support as well. They even have a feature called Ally Moms which they're also trying to you know, bring more dads into the process where um, if a mom or a dad needs someone to talk to one-on-one, -on -one, they'll, they'll match you up and give you a phone number or you know, an email link and you can talk one-on-one -on -one if you're not a group type person. Also, organization called PFLAG, and I believe there is a chapter in, in Jackson. We're um, trying to bring it back. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, so PFLAG... It. PFLAG started out years ago as parents and friends of lesbians and gays. Um, but over time, there's less of a less of a need for that. I mean, there's still a need, but in general, you know, more families are okay if their kids come out gay. Um, but what they're what they found was that, you know, they were they were getting a lot of parents who were coming saying, my kid has come out as trans, my kid of any age. Um, so they, they dropped, they, they just used the acronym PFLAG to take away the reference to lesbian and gays because really it's, it's pretty LGBTQ spectrum open. So PFLAG is a support group that usually meets when they run uh, once a month and they, again, do the thing where they have a, you know, a lot of them do have a parent group and a youth group. Um, so if they can bring it back in Jackson, that would be great. Um, there are also other online resources, an organization from California called Gender Spectrum has online support groups for parents, and they have online support groups for grandparents, and they have online support groups in Spanish, and they have online support group, just the spectrum. Uh, so that's another good resource to know about. 
Yeah, and you were speaking of the changes. So GSA changed as well. It's no longer the Gay Straight Alliance. It is the Gender Sexualities Alliance. So there you go. Right. Yep. Yep. So Rebecca has posted some uh, links here. When it Thanks. comes to starting a GSA in your school, um, if they have any other clubs, they need to be having a GSA. There is no... There is precedent there that if you have a prayer group, you need to have a GSA. You know, we're open to, <laughs> there's no discrimination when it comes to after school clubs. Right. Yeah, all they need is a, a, an adult um, yep. sponsor, whatever. All right. I'm getting... All right. If you're here for CEUs or sketches, here is the form. Uh, Lifeways, I think, is working also on a support group for adults for LGBT. I don't know if that's still happening. Is there a Lifeways person that can confirm that in the room? Thought I found one. But yeah, definitely give them a call. Sorry, Rebecca, yeah. this is Shannon. I, I, I believe, hey, sorry, I couldn't find my button, the mute button They're quick fine. enough. Um, I believe so, yeah, Chad would probably, Chad or um, our access and engagement team would probably have more information, but I do know that I read some minutes today and they are working on that. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Rebecca, I believe you have my slides, including the um, glossary and all that, I believe. Yes, I believe so. So okay. if not, if let I me know. I'll let you know. Yeah. And, and likewise, if anyone has any questions that come up over the next, you know, week or so, if they can certainly either email me directly or through you reach out and I'd be glad to provide information if, if there was any, you know, study I reference that you want the, you know, the more details on or or you know, question about well, what about twins, or what about adopted kids, or what about kids on the spectrum, which are that is a thing as well. Interesting topics <laughs> um, relevant to this population. So again, if you're getting CEUs, that's the form. Uh oh, Let me make sure it's the right form. <laughs> <laughs> It's at the very end. It's number 12 for some reason. <laughs> Crystal, sorry, I guess I forgot to check you. Great. Rebecca, are there nursing CEUs or just social work and prevention? There's social work and prevention this time. Okay. We missed the deadline on the CMEs. Okay, nope, thank you. <laughs> Well, if there's nothing else, I, I would yeah, imagine I people, good. Would, people would imagine oh, people would enjoy a, a, a moment to uh, a catch moment. up on their emails or use the restroom or refresh yeah. their beverage. Now, yeah, go ahead and do that. Our next sessions we have Brenda Lindsay talking about cultivating resilience. Uh, we have the VA, Matthew and Jeremy talking about suicide risk identification and safety planning. And then we have Stephanie Schweda talking about psychological first aid. So, those are your next sessions. And they All right, start well, at 1045. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>